Welcome back to our last section of Module 1, Section 1 1.5, where we talk about the changes that happen over the course of a year, since we've only started to talk about the changes that happen over the course of a day. We're going to be finishing up our entire discussion of Chapter 2 from our textbook, and we're going to be introducing one additional section of Chapter 4 in this section of the lecture videos. In Module 2, we'll be continuing Chapter 4 and then adding to our understanding with other topics. All right, so let's get started. We um, have talked about the constellations that fall along the ecliptic when we talked about the star charts, and we discussed the origins of astrology um, when we were talking about the history of astronomy a couple videos back. When we think about what that um, ecliptic looks like, not as a path through our sky on the celestial sphere model, but as our path around the sun in a three-dimensional solar system, this diagram can kind of help us figure out what it means for the sun to be going through those constellations. This diagram, although it's not to scale, is helping us with the perspective. All of the constellations along the zodiac are um, where the sun appears to be based on our direction of looking towards those different constellations. But as the Earth orbits the sun every year, the um, stars that appear to be behind the sun change, so that's where we get the astrological star signs, um, but the stars that are in the opposite direction from the sun also change, and that's our night sky constellations that are visible. Now when we look, what I do want us to recognize is astrology started back in ancient Babylon thousands of years ago, and when it did, the sun um, was moving through a slightly different path on our sky because of this large-scale motion we talked about in the history of astronomy section called precession, the 26,000 years of the Earth's tilt pointing at slightly different places. So, for example, my star sign is Taurus. That typically is um, in astrology from April 20th to May 20th, if I were to look, look at my horoscope. But when we look at where the sun actually appears, in the constellation Taurus, as defined by the patch of sky, the IAU's um, definition of constellation, it goes from March 13th to June 22nd. That's almost a month worth of um, change because of this large-scale motion of precession. So um, some astrology has updated from ancient Babylon, um, but the traditional dates that people look up in tables do not correspond with the actual location of the sun um, in our sky. But when we talk about these, what I want us to connect with is the fact that if we do know our star sign, for example, from astrology, um, that is not going to be um, the same time of year when we were born. It's not going to be the same time of year when we actually get to see that constellation well at night. We have to wait for sunset and a couple hours after that for the sun for the sky to get fully dark. And so, for example, I told you um, the Taurus constellation. It's typically um, for May, uh, end of April, start of May birthdays. The sun's actually there from May through June, and it is best seen in the nighttime sky in the winter, about six months later. Um, you don't have to write down all of these constellations, but if you are curious on when you can actually see these constellations, they're going to be very much offset from the astrological dates um, from when you're born. And if we look at the very bottom, um, bullet point here, what we'll see is that there are constellations that we can see all year round. These are constellations that are near the North Star that make these big circular motions instead of rising or setting, and they will appear in different locations um, in the sky uh, at different times of year. Um, if we're looking, for example, at 11 p.m. every single night, um, they'll be showing up in different places over the course of the year, but they'll always be visible. When we look south instead, though, the constellations we see, the stars that we see, will change from one month to the next. So let's pause and check on that a little bit. This is a question that is similar to one of the questions I ended the previous video with, and I want us to kind of think a little bit more about it, and it's okay if we're not quite sure yet, but try to commit to an answer or at least narrow down your options. So pause the video, read the question and the options. All right. So um, what I hope from our critical thinking skill that we're building, what I hope is that 
by discussing these changes that I'm talking about, we might have ruled out option two pretty quickly because this whole this whole video is talking about changes that happen over the course of a year, which means from one week to the next, there also have to be some small changes. It can't be exactly the same place as it was before. So option two, we have to rule out. And I hope that we felt pretty confident overall ruling out option four. If it's just rising in the east, it is not going to be way over on the other side of the sky, um, only a week difference. That option four would be six months apart um, when we would start to see that star on the opposite side of the sky. So we've narrowed down to two options, and that already is a lot of strong critical thinking at work. Excellent job if we did that. Um, options one and three are basically saying there's a small change up or there's a small change down. And then this is when we can connect with this idea um, that I mentioned in at the end of the previous video and when we defined the solar day um, and the sidereal day. We didn't have to really spend too much time on that, but we recognize that there was a small difference between how we set our clocks based on the sun and when stars show up again. There's a four minute difference. So each day the stars shift in our sky by a four minute um, change. And so as we go through the whole year, those four minutes add up and all of the zodiac constellations kind of march across our nighttime sky and they appear to be where the sun is throughout the course of the year. So that every time that we get back to um, May, Taurus is behind the sun um, every single time. All right, so let's start to talk about seasons since we've been talking about these changes over the course of the year. Seasons is a really big topic for us. It's one of our big course learning outcomes, um, and so we want to feel confident with them. Um, we started to talk about the calendar in section 1.2, and we first introduced ourselves to this idea of breaking the year up into quarters at that point. So let's, let's talk together about um, these four special dates in our calendar and the terms we use to describe that whole chunk of time in between these special dates. Because we're going to be relying on this um, diagram for a couple of different questions uh, for the rest of this video. So we're going to begin with the winter solstice. We can kind of start our year journey um, at the winter solstice. Solstice is a word that comes from the Latin for standstill. Um, as we get towards the winter solstice in our calendar and away from it, changes to where the sun is um, in altitude in the sky are very, very small because the Latin solstice means standstill. There's not a lot of changes. We get way down to the lowest point that the sun is going to get at the winter solstice, and then it will start to make its way back up quite slowly. But the winter solstice is going to be the shortest day of our year, the shortest amount of daylight. The sun is going to be below the horizon for the longest amount of time, the longest night time. Um, and it's going to be at its lowest point in the sky as an altitude, which means that it won't be heating our ground very effectively. That sounds like the winter that we know, right? Um, the sun's not very high and it's not in the sky for very long. So let's move on to the spring equinox. This is another special date in the calendar. So the winter solstice is typically happening around December 21st for the Northern Hemisphere. The spring equinox is about three months later at March 21st. Now the spring or vernal equinox, um, we've heard that term vernal equinox once before when we were talking about the star charts. It's where our um, right ascension starts counting at zero. But the spring equinox or vernal equinox is the day of the year when we get exactly 12 hours of day and exactly 12 hours of night. Um, the spring equinox, um, equinox, that term, comes from the Latin for equal night. So that 12 and 12 um, is typical of both equinoxes. As we continue through the year, three months later, we get the summer solstice. The summer solstice is the exact opposite extreme from the winter solstice. The summer solstice is our longest period of daylight, our shortest nighttime. The sun is highest it's going to get in the sky on the summer solstice. Um, and that's our extreme uh, date, the longest day. That happens on June 21st. And then three months later, we get the other equinox. Equinox tells us that it means equal day, equal night. So on the fall equinox or the autumnal equinox, um, we get um, 12 hours of day and 12 hours of night. And that typically happens on September 21st in the Northern Hemisphere. 
The specific calendar date shifts a little bit. Um, part of that is because of our leap year. We don't have exactly 365 days in a year. We have um, that extra quarter built in. Um, but it's also because this alignment is happening act at a specific moment in time. So for different time zones, that's gonna put it on slightly different calendar dates from one year to the next, but it's always a specific moment um, and alignment in time. Now, what I want us to recognize is that we know about the terms used to describe for the entire quarter of the year between these special dates. Our calendar doesn't just have four days in it, right? I've listed four special days, but we know that there are chunks of time that don't have this special term, but are still relevant and useful. The entire three months from the winter solstice to the vernal equinox is called winter, but we know in Grand Rapids that the end of December doesn't feel the same as mid-February, even though we all bunch it into just winter. What we want to remember is that every single day there are small changes that build up to get to the extremes of the solstice and the in-between special points of the equinoxes. Keeping in mind that those changes continue to happen every single day is going to help us with some of the questions that we're going to be asking at the end of this video. All right, so before we really launch into seasons as a topic, um, I want us to kind of think about the coverage that we've had both in um, prior science classes and just our general understanding from popular media on what causes seasons on Earth. So pause the video and think through the options. All right, so the most common answer, if we were to ask people who had no interest in astronomy and weren't taking a science class, the most common answer people would give um, is option one, which is incorrect. If you wrote down option one, I don't want you to feel bad, but I do want you to make a big highlighted circled note to yourself in your notebook that this is a topic that you've got some misunderstanding about, and we want to be really careful to correct that misunderstanding. So when the Earth is physically closest to the sun and physically farthest to the sun, um, those points in time are known. Um, they have special names that we'll talk about in later um, chapters, perihelion and aphelion, and we are actually closest to the sun in January, like mid-January is the, is the specific time. It doesn't affect our seasons at all, um, but we could look up when perihelion is. That distance does not change dramatically. If I were to take one step from this room and take one step west, I could say I'm closer to Chicago, but I'm really not actually fundamentally usefully closer to Chicago um, for that small amount of change. And that's really what we want to think about is there's a very small amount of change in the distance and it's not playing a role in these drastic shifts from winter weather to summer weather. So instead, the correct answer is three, but in our college-level science class, we're going to get into a lot of detail so that it's not just a fact we write down, that it's the tilt of the earth. We actually understand. We have critical thinking understanding of what is happening when the earth's tilt is involved. It doesn't have a mindset. It's not thinking about changing the weather, but as the earth rotates, it tilts towards the sun and away from the sun, and we're going to talk about what that looks like. So if we really did struggle with that distance question, one thing that can help us to kind of separate our thoughts a little bit is the fact that when we name seasons, we're referring to the weather. So let's say, for example, that it's January um, 1st. Everyone has just celebrated New Year's from our calendars, um, and it's winter, okay? Everybody's um, calendar says January 1st, whether we live in Grand Rapids or Australia. But in Grand Rapids on January 1st, we're experiencing winter, and Australia is experiencing summer, which means that putting the whole Earth closer or farther to cause seasons wouldn't make sense for the fact that the Southern Hemisphere has the opposite um, seasons that we do. So instead, what I want us to recognize is that when we talk about the season um, words, we're going to be focusing on the Northern Hemisphere, but we can actually see that um, everything we talk about is happening in reverse for the Southern Hemisphere. So for example, on the right side of this image, the winter solstice, we're labeling it December 21st. In Australia, it would be December 21st and the sun, um, the earth is tilted towards the sun, but here in the northern hemisphere, we're being tilted away from the sun. 
on the equinoxes. Um, it's a little hard to see in this two in this one two dimensional picture, um, but instead of tilting towards the sun or away from the sun, we're actually tilted sideways, which is why everyone on Earth has 12 hours of daylight and 12 hours of nighttime. Um, and then the summer solstice is when we're tilted towards the sun, putting it in a different part of our sky as it rises and sets. And that's going to be something we explore next. So this is the summary of what I'm going to try to convince you um, to be able to be able to picture, answer questions about, and feel confident in. This is the summary of what Earth's tilt actually does over the course of a year. The Altitude of the sun, that term altitude we've talked about before, that's the angle height above the horizon. The altitude of the sun changes. If we are tilted towards the sun, we've put the sun closer to the northern um, celestial pole, it's going to be higher physically in the sky. So when it reaches its highest point, it's higher up. That means that it's going to be um, more direct sunlight, uh, steeper angle as the sunlight comes down. And as we tilt towards and away from the sun, we are changing the amount of daylight we get because the sun is rising and setting in different locations around our horizon, which give it a longer or shorter path. We talked about this with stars in the previous um, videos that we've watched for the celestial sphere. Some stars are in the sky for a full 24 hours every single day, and some are barely above our sky. When we're moving where the sun physically appears in our sky over the course of a day, we are changing how much daylight um, and nighttime we're getting. This um, linked simulator is extremely useful and it's something that we'll, um, we'll explore in any on-campus time you have with me and I really encourage you to explore if you're taking this class online only um, for the non-lab classes. All right, so this set of images um, is almost like still shots from that um, from that simulator, but this is an image from our textbook. These are showing the solstices and the equinoxes. So on the far left, we have the sun's path on the summer solstice. So we see that it rises really far northeast. It gets very high in the sky. It is not hitting the zenith. We could draw a line and it is not hitting directly overhead, but it gets very high in the sky and then it sets um, in the northwest. On both equinoxes, the sun is actually following exactly where the celestial equator does, going from due east to high in the southern sky along the meridian to setting due west. Only on those special two dates do we get exactly lined up like that. That's why they have the 12-hour day and 12-hour night um, that, that we see. And then on December 21st, that's the other extreme, the sun is setting way south of east, it goes very low in the sky, so even at its highest point in the southern sky along the meridian, it's not very high up, and it sets in the southwest. I encourage you to pause the video, draw some of this in your notebook, and try to think about the sun's path at any date in the calendar. I'm going to ask you about it later in the slides, but it's something that's worth practicing right now. So let's talk about these two ideas that we've, that we've introduced. The idea that the sun's height in the sky is changing is the first one. So we, we tend to use the phrases direct sunlight and indirect sunlight to talk about the angle at which sunlight is coming down and hitting the ground. If sunlight is coming from a very steep um, angle, it's going to hit the ground and spread out that energy very effectively, heating the ground very well. If it comes in at a shallow angle, like at the start of the morning or the end of a, um, a long afternoon where the sun is low in the sky, it spreads its light out and it is not heating the ground as effectively. It's not as hot. These two images are showing when the Earth is tilted towards the sun, that northern hemisphere is getting more direct sunlight, the angle is not as steep, and when the sun is tilted away, um, or when the Earth is tilted away from the sun, that um, angle that sunlight hits the ground is, is actually much more shallow. If we kind of look at where it would be hitting at, um, at Michigan, it's much more shallow. The upper left of this slide helps us with those angles, so rather than taking the global view, we're looking at the observer view. A steep um, angle comes from the sun being high in the sky, like in the summer, and that shallow angle um, comes from the sun being low in the sky, um, like winter. The two images on the right here were taken on a uh, sunny day in uh, Grand Rapids that had 
just happened after a snowfall. It was still relatively cold, like the air temperature would still be in the low 30s, but because there was a nice sunlit um, day and it was heating the ground, a lot of the snow melted. But what I saw when I looked out the fourth floor window, and so I came down a couple of hours to take a second picture, uh, was that the, the path uh, underneath, in the shadow of our uh, walkway, the snow was still there because it was not getting direct sunlight. So on the exact same day where the ambient temperature is a given value, direct sunlight versus indirect sunlight is going to change the heating effectiveness of the ground. And this is a nice example of that. We've all probably stood in the shade to be a little bit cooler on a sunny day. Um, it's that same idea, just on this full scale instead of on a particular location. The slide here notes that if we are curious about the exact angles, the sun can get 23 and a half degrees above the celestial equator or 23 and a half degrees below the celestial equator. What that means is in Grand Rapids, the sun can get about as high as 70 degrees um, altitude, so 70 degrees above the horizon, and that's the best it's going to do. It can't get above that. If we lived somewhere else on the globe, it would have different behavior over the course of our calendar. So I wanna pause and think about that and really try to hit home this misconception and this um, idea that a lot of people bring with them. So we wanna think about when a vertical pole would cast a shadow or cast no shadow uh, where we live here in Grand Rapids. So pause the video and think through the options. All right, so I have an image here. This is a real photograph taken not in Grand Rapids, but rather in, um, in Hawaii. And it is a, a sculpture of a um, bike as a bike rack. And we can see that the, the shadow is only directly underneath it. So if we're talking about a pole, there is no directly underneath the pole. So no shadow happens if the sun is directly overhead. Because the sun can never be directly overhead, the answer here is four for this question for Grand Rapids, Michigan. And it is because we are too far away from the equator. If we lived um, at a latitude of 23.5 degrees north or closer to the equator, then we would see this behavior. And in Hawaii, they do see this behavior, this, click, this clickable link in our posted slides, um, or if you search Lahaina Noon, you will see... Um, pictures of this situation. And it looks really strange. It kind of looks like a video game that hasn't rendered properly because we really don't see this behavior, even though in our heads, maybe we think it happens every day or we think it happens on the summer solstice and it simply doesn't. It can't. All right. The next thing I'd like you to think about is the amount of daylight that we receive. The amount of daylight we receive is going to be based on where the sun is rising and setting, because if it is um, north of east and uh, north of west in its path, we'll have lots of daylight. It will have a big path above the horizon. And if it's setting, uh, if it's rising south of east and setting south of west, it's going to have a small path and we're going to have less daylight. So I'd like you to pause the video so that you can break our whole calendar up into, four, into three categories, A, B, and C here. So pause um, and write down your best um, description of each of these answers. All right, hopefully you paused. For option A here, um, if you wrote the words fall and spring, then we need to cross them out. That is six months worth of time and that is way too much time. That is incorrect. We cannot count that as a correct answer. Because the sun is rising due east on only two days out of the entire year. And we need to recognize that if we have just used the season name, we have applied three months of time to that. And we might not have meant to, but we need to be very specific. The sun only rises due east on the spring equinox and on the fall equinox, no other days. It is only the middle two dates that we um, saw in this diagram where we're exactly lined up like that. For part B, somewhere north of east, if you wrote summer solstice, that is a correct day, but it is missing a lot of time. If you wrote just summer, that is also partially correct, but you're still missing a big amount of time. You've only applied three months of time and we're still missing a lot in our calendar. So the true answer to part B would be the day after the spring equinox, so like March 22nd, 
all the way through spring and all the way through summer until the day before the fall equinox, so until September 20th. We have to apply very nearly six months worth of time to that category because we have to break the year up into these three categories. And then likewise for part C, if you said the winter solstice, you're partially correct, but you've missed so much time that that really isn't a correct answer. If you wrote just winter, you're still missing a big chunk of time, and so that's not a complete answer. So part C, the correct answer is the day after the fall equinox, so September 22nd, all the way through fall and all the way through winter until the day before the spring equinox, so March 20th. That's how we would have to break the calendar down. And that's why this diagram that I've made is so useful for us to use. We can think about the top half or the bottom half or the left side or the right side and recognize that there are, um, there are behaviors that last a long time and there are behaviors that only happen at those exact special crossing moments. So to wrap up this video, I'd like you to pause and answer all of these questions for today's date your date when you're watching this, which is not the same as the date that I'm recording this, um, and see how confident you feel in answering each of these. So pause the video. Now, for the compass directions rising and setting, um, we kind of talked about those. North goes with north and south goes with south. So for the top half of this diagram, um, fall through winter, that whole time we're rising southeast and setting southwest. If you're instead watching this in the bottom half of the diagram, we'd be um, rising northeast and setting northwest. For how the sunlight amount changes and how the um, altitude changes, we're actually thinking about the times between solstices. So if you're answering this question on the left side of this diagram from summer all the way through fall, you're going to be getting less um, sunlight amount over time and the sun is going to be getting lower in the sky. If instead you answered on the right side of the diagram from winter all the way through spring, the sunlight is going to be increasing over time and the sun is going to be getting higher in the sky over time. So we've answered for all dates at all moments in the year, which is pretty exciting. Um, and for the distance between the sun and the earth, it matters not at all. Um, it doesn't show up in the diagram. It doesn't matter to us. It does not affect the seasons. And we really want to hit home that idea that the distance between the sun and the earth doesn't change that much and definitely does not affect our seasons. Thanks for watching. We've made it through a whole module, module one out of six, um, and I will see you in module two for new topics. Thanks for watching.